So if Donald or Walter would say, Larry, we're, when we go to the bridge at the such and such, I would be able to tell the musicians that's bar 19, B flat 7th with a raise 9. You call me a fool, you say it's a crazy scheme. This one's for real, I already bought the dream. You can sort of hear the, the bass... Uh, it's just sort of floating along, you know, I was overdubbing over a, an existing track. Usually the bass player has to work a little harder to drive the uh, the track, but it was already there and for some reason I kind of like the idea of just floating along here in the verse. And then here it goes to sort of a more conventional... Now, later we added... Uh, beat, rhythmic beat. We added uh, acoustic guitar. Dean Parks. Yeah. It's nice. One interesting thing about Donald and Walter is that perfection is not what they're after. They're, they're, they're after something that you want to listen to over and over again. So we would work then past the perfection point until it became natural, until it sounded almost improvised in a way. So it was like a two-step process. One was to get to perfection and then the other is to get beyond it and to loosen it up a little bit so that it didn't have to be the perfect squeaky clean goal. It is quite an amalgamation, that's for sure. And it's uh, interesting to note that uh, it can be a hit. Deacon Blues is about as close to autobiography as, as our tunes get. You know, we were both kids who grew up in the suburbs. Uh, we both felt, you know, fairly alienated. But like a lot of uh, uh, kids in the 50s, we were looking for some kind of alternative culture, some kind of uh, escape, really, from, from uh, where we found ourselves. And I think Deacon Blues is a nice kind of example of, of that. Make love to these women, languid and... The, uh, the protagonist is not a musician. He just sort of imagines that that would be one of the um, mythic forms of loserdom to which he might aspire. And, um, you know, who's to say that he's not right? Nothing like that. There's a synthesizer pad on here somewhere. Yeah, this what thing What the hell here. is that all about? Let's see. Go roll back a second, Roger. Oh, there, oh, there it is. <laughs> it's got <laughs> department store. That's what I'm thinking of. It's yeah. like that bing, bing I know. here. Okay. It's like, you know, what's the big toy store on 59th Street? F.A.O. Schwartz. F.A.O. Schwartz. It's like, you know, they play that same song mm -hmm. over and over right. with those kinds of sounds in them. Yeah. Kids like it because it's, it's like such a primary, Christmassy. It's the equivalent of an audio equivalent of a primary color kind of thing, you know? It's kind of a pheromone for tots. You bring them in and... We put that in. Why did we put that in there? Because, you know why? To fatten the I think the maybe horns? the flute, there was a flute part on the top and the uh, muted trumpets that didn't cut. We wanted to cut. So I wanted to put a little high end on to the... To brighten uh, and clarify. Right, so then here's it is without the synthesizer. It goes like this. Or maybe we couldn't find a flute player or something. Okay, now let's play it again and I'll put this guy in here. It's sort of a flute simulation, really. Or, uh, it's marked here as a celeste, so maybe we were thinking of it for some reason as though it were like a uh, bells or something going along with that thing. Although it doesn't sound the least bit like a celeste. I was always amazed that they pretty much heard in their heads what it was going to be like completed. So they knew right away when you get a bunch of musicians together and they're cutting the tracks and Donald Walter would be sitting in the control room going, no, this is not it, it's not going to happen. So maybe we'll try this other tune with these guys. Then they get another band in to, uh, to try the tunes that, that didn't work out. And uh, all through the project, uh, they would know, oh, nope, that's not it, that's not working, um, this is what I want. And uh, it was amazing that when the thing got done, finally I could see what everything was going to be like. Um, but they knew from the, from the very beginning. I play just what I feel. Beautiful. The basic gospel response type of thing. The 
we put in the lead and we'll see. Part of the reason I was driven towards jazz was when the radio stopped playing Chuck Berry and Little, Little Richard, uh, and this is when I was quite young, but I still noticed that, that something was wrong with the music after a while when they started playing white singers like um, Frankie Avalon and, uh, and uh, that kind of thing. I like black music, essentially, whether it be R&B or gospel or jazz, you know. My mom was a singer in uh, the hotels in the Catskills when she was a little girl. She used to do it in the summers till, till she was a teenager. And she used to sing around the house, so, so I'm familiar with the, the uh, repertoire, you know. Both Walter and I have a background that includes songwriting from the 20s, 30s, and 40s, and 50s, mostly in jazz versions. Yeah, I mean, there are people who've read books and there's people who ain't read books. They've got a skill um, that can make images that aren't pure and don't make you think you've heard it before. Very Hollywood filmic, in a way. The imagery is very imaginable, in a visual sense. Uptown, baby. Uptown, baby. We get down, baby. I find a crown, baby. Uptown baby, uptown baby, we gets down baby, I'm for the crown baby Now if it wasn't for the Bronx, this rap probably never would be going on So tell me where you from Uptown baby, uptown baby, we gets down baby, I'm for the crown baby It does sound familiar, doesn't yeah. it? In the corner of my eye, I saw you and Rudy I saw you and Rudy You were very high You were very high Well, it starts out, the guy's talking about this, this girl he's, that he's involved with, and, and she's uh, sitting at a counter, and um, he describes her behavior and habits, and um, out of that you begin to see the, her character and uh, their relationship. This tune really does speak for itself in a way. It's daunting to the comic. Black cow, uh, an ice cream soda. They used to, or, or, or we're, at, we're confused about this actually. We, I thought it was a soda. There seem to be regional, regional variations on the formula, but it's root beer and vanilla ice cream or soft drink. Something like that. Frothy soft drink. Very big in the soda fountains when we were kids. Like a gangster on the, on the run. You will stagger home. You will stagger homeward to your precious one. I'm the one. Let's make everything right. Talk it out, Talk it out till daylight. Chorus. Walter and I both grew up in around in the New York area. Walter's originally from Westchester, and then I moved out to Queens, and, but went to school in Manhattan. And I'm from New Jersey, maybe 20 minutes over the bridge. So uh, yeah, we both grew up in this area. So uh, I think New York life is what we most know about. There's a solo by Victor, very good solo by Victor Feldman. Live on the tracking day. Well, we answered an ad in the Village Boys. I said, you know, must have jazz chops. Keyboard. No 
keyboard. No hang-ups. Right. Keyboard. <laughs> keyboard. Keyboard and bass player needed for working. Working. Um, you know, jazz Keep, rock uh, combo. Something like that. You know, must have jazz chops. No hang-ups. No hang-ups. So we answered the ad and. Uh, we called and uh, we went out to Hicksville, Long Island, which for, for us was quite a haul, you know, because we never left Manhattan. We went out and we went in, in the basement, you know, it was like a kid with a ba basement band, and uh, we liked some of the material. It was kind of early fusion type material before there was jazz fusion in a way. You know, it's like when they're in the same room at the same time, uh, they're just like one person with two brains, you know, so it's the highbrow, intellectual humor, you know, you, you don't get any fart jokes or anything of the kind. And they can usually finish each other's sentences. Well, I first met them uh, when I put an ad in the Village Voice because I had a band and we were looking for a bass player and a piano player. And they answered the ad, so they joined my band at first. And then one by one, we realized that, that there was deficiency in, in certain of the players that, uh, you know, uh, that wasn't quite up to this. You know, we started playing their songs right away, and uh, I immediately saw that these were great songs. If truth be told, we kind of took over his band. We kind of... Uh, we wrecked it. Towards the end of the first rehearsal. Started throwing out the other guys, you know, and kept yeah. Danny sort of, you know. And that, in a way, was the core of the Steely Dan group. Later, because when we got a job out in LA, we, we sent for Denny. Yeah. 